Um, thank you for doing this. And could you first maybe just introduce yourself briefly? Um, my name is uh, Alexander Chimeris. Um, and, uh, well, I'm co-founder of uh, Moscow Hackerspace and also a founder of uh, a company called Fairwaves. We are, we are building uh, profitable mobile networks for specifically for developing countries. Uh, yeah, just also to, to mention it quickly, uh, this audio is for Hacker Archive and it will be stored in the archive and published on YouTube. So you're okay with that? You sure. aware about that? Uh, so yeah, tell me, uh, well, let's start probably from your background. Mm -hmm. What, uh, what, what was your education? How, how you came to, uh, to your project and how, uh, how you started the Hacker Space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, my background is uh, in uh, uh, mathematics, engineering, and computer science. Um, so it was, uh, it's not a pure computer science in the like, Western meaning because our educational system was different. So, But typically it's computer science education. Mm -hmm. So I've been doing uh, computer programming since uh, since I was in, uh, in high school. And uh, um, it just so happened that... Um, Around uh, 2008-9, um, I was interested in. Uh, I was always interested in open source, and I was uh, interested uh, in uh, um, something called software-defined radios. What's that? It's uh, you can think about it as a, a sound card for radio waves. Like uh -huh. a sound card, you can digitize uh, sound signals. And uh, with uh, software-defined radios, you can digitize um, radio signals. So you can receive them, you can transmit them using... Uh, you plug this into your laptop, and you can receive and transmit mm -hmm. the radio mm -hmm. signals. Mm -hmm. So, um, and um, there were a couple of open-source projects uh, which were um, uh, like revolving around this idea and uh, open-source projects, and uh, we became a part of, of this. So we were interested in a project called OpenBTS, which was uh, um, a, a project to create a GSM base station uh, using software-defined radios and mm -hmm. open-source software. Mm -hmm. And uh, kind of because uh, previously I was working with Voice over IP or developing Voice over IP systems, um, so I had some communications background, communications in terms of uh, telecommunications, and, uh, voice communications. Com um, so communications background. And uh, we combine this with the software-defined radios, um, and uh, that that like was the beginning of of like everything we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like over the course of several years, we created our own software-defined radios. We created our own uh, base stations, um, which were originally deployed in uh, 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 like for example by non-profit organizations in uh, Mexico and in indigenous communities there to mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. to provide um, to provide communications to underserved indigenous communities um, and um, which were basically abandoned by uh, large telecommunication companies um, and uh, after that like we were like gradually commercializing this idea and now we are working with uh, uh, with um, with carriers, with uh, mobile operators in, in Africa, and uh, um, with a with the business model which makes it um, which makes it profitable for mobile operators to go into uh, underserved or unserved areas mm -hmm. uh, there, basically in remote villages which have no communication, no power. Um, so that's uh, what we are doing, and. Um, this kind of led to creation of the hackerspace because um, two things combined. First of all, we uh, originally started just as like a couple people, a few people, and we were working from home and doing these projects. But uh, when we were doing software development, it was fine. When we started engaging with hardware, it became increasingly more complex because uh, when you work as a team on some hardware project, you do need some physical space where this hardware is present, where we can work with it. So, like, we had to, like, pass our equipment between our team members mm -hmm. 
So like okay, today I'm using this this piece of hardware. The, the more I'm giving it to you, you're using this piece of hardware, and it just was very very um, complex in terms of logistics. So yeah. uh, we needed like a kind of an office, but we didn't like really want to have like an office office office. So um, at the same time, um, in 2000, I think it was 2010. In December, uh, we um, went to Berlin to Chaos Communication Congress, mm -hmm, which is mm -hmm. a large uh, hacker conference in, yeah. in, uh, in Europe. And, um, and that was our uh, first experience with the hacker, like with European hacker culture, uh, with the hacker spaces. And uh, we uh, were just so impressed with what we've seen there that uh, when we uh, came back to, to Moscow, uh, we um, really wanted to create a hacker space here. Uh, back then, there were like no hacker spaces in Russia or any CIS countries. There was no even mm -hmm. like idea mm -hmm. of this. And um, at the same time, that was a time when the hacker space movement was very actively evolving and uh, I would say like booming around Western Europe, mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. the United States. I think it was 2007-8 when uh, um, the whole idea was brought to the United States as it, and then, as it often happens, guys from the United States marketed it so heavily, it, mm -hmm, it went mm -hmm. viral uh, around yeah. the world. So that was like a beginning of this whole, uh, whole hacker space boom. So uh, we uh, came here, I wrote about this in my blog, which I um, maintained back then, and... Uh, um, I met with um, a couple other people, um, and uh, with uh, Dmitry Alexiuk and Alisa Shevchenko, mm -hmm. and they brought uh, one of their friends, uh, Vladimir Vronsov, and uh, four of us. Basically, we decided that we should uh, create hacker space, and uh, like we met in January, and uh, I think in April we found a space. Yeah, Alisa nice. found a space, mm -hmm. and then. Uh, um, in, I don't remember, I think in June, July, uh, we were already opening the space. It was mm -hmm, not here, mm -hmm. it was uh, Luznetska and Abirzhne. Um, but, okay. um, yeah, so, again, so what I was saying is, so basically two ideas. First of all, it was a personal need for, for space. And uh, secondly, it was uh, this, like, fascination, uh, um, fascination of, of the, um, the the culture, which we seen, which which we saw in uh, um, in in in, uh, in uh, Berlin mm -hmm. in this at this conference. So um, that's uh, that's the, that's the story in brief. And, uh, okay, so the first residents were basically your company and some initiatives from your yeah. It was it was, uh, so it was it was our company. It was. Uh, uh, Alisa Shevchenko company, it was uh, Vladimir uh, company, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, just a couple of friends. All right. Uh, okay, so now you moved here in this space, mm -hmm. in Hochlovko, in the city center, and uh, what kind of projects now under development development here, and what who are your recent residents, and like how? Yeah, so... Uh, what's, what's um, interesting happening? Right now... Like just for historical reasons, uh, all companies which were doing, um, uh, which were doing uh, any security research, like computer security research, um, information security research, they moved out of hacker space. They grew basically grew out of the hacker space. Mm -hmm. We have a number of companies uh, which were started in the hacker space, but they grew out. They became bigger, okay. and they moved out. So all these companies moved out, and uh, right now um, we have companies who have no nothing to do with like information security. So we have people who are doing um, um, who are doing uh, what's called um, industrial design. Mm -hmm. So they, for example, designed um, enclosure for our base stations. Okay. And they did uh, design for some other companies nice. who were so here. Nice collaboration. Yeah, um, and we have uh, uh, people who are um, working on um, uh, uh, wireless technologies for Internet of Things. Mm -hmm. um, we uh, have company who is doing um, um, who is doing what's called. Um, um, 
or uh, not sure how it's called in English. Basically, um, they call this uh, or does uh, for um, fixing oh, your okay. fixing your uh, your hands uh, after you break a bone. Mm -hmm. They they 3D print it, for like example. Exo yeah, like the exo the yeah. kind of yeah, exoskeleton for yeah. for fixing the bones after okay. after you break mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And the uh, number of uh, like individuals who are um, who are just like doing various stuff like freelancers and okay. things like this. Okay. So we also had uh, um, a company who were doing 3D printing sitting next to us. Um, now they also like moved out. Uh, we had a company which was working on uh, um, artificial intelligence, similar to um, you know like Amazon Echo like, mm -hmm. or like uh, Google Home. Is it basically, the cube? yeah, the cube, yeah. The, the cubic, the cubic uh, robotics yeah. company. They were sitting in this room, okay. uh, which we are taking now. So um, they also kind of grew out of the space and, and moved out. And uh, now we are uh, neighboring with the whole computer who are working on uh, like virtual reality and uh, um, like interactive yeah, interactive, art, immersive, technology, immersive technologies. Immersive technologies. Like they are also working on the um, edge between art and uh, and, uh, and computers, basically. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's uh, kind of the scope of, of people being here. Okay. Uh, well, tell me probably a bit more about Fairwaves, uh, what you're working on now, and like you, you already started to talk about how the system works, but maybe a bit more details. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So, um, in Fairwaves, we uh, really uh, try to kind of reinvent, uh, reinvent mobile technologies for uh, from perspective making them um, more efficient, more um, more agile and uh, more suitable for a uh, low cost low cost deployments. So like right now uh, is like I was mentioning before uh, uh, we, we we've developed a uh, technology for our 2G networks which is voice and SMS mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and like very very slow data. Um, and uh, we can deploy them very, very efficiently in uh, remote areas. So uh, the challenges which we are facing there um, are very specific because these are places where there is no power and, um, and they are usually quite remote, which means that... Mm, so there is no... Um, there is no established like internet connection into there mm -hmm. and the only way to uh, connect um, to the internet or to any mm -hmm. other network is uh, using satellite technology and uh, which is very expensive yeah which is very expensive so uh, we are facing two things first of all it's uh, expensive electricity mm -hmm. and it's expensive expensive uh, communication from this location to the rest of the world yeah so um, the technology which we have developed is uh, very efficient on power, um, like our base station, which can provide uh, mobile coverage in the radius of three five kilometers radius from uh, from the tower. Mm -hmm. uh, it consumes only um, forty five watts of power, similar to a light bulb. Okay. Oh well. Uh, and uh, so it can be powered completely from solar panels, and uh, because we are forced to use um, satellite modems. Uh, we also work uh, put a lot of effort into um, optimizing for the bandwidth consumption. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is that because uh, this location is so remote, uh, providing any kind of maintenance is very difficult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if something breaks, like right now we have pilots in, in Africa, pilot sites in Africa, and like the, the pilot sites are located about uh, five six hours of driving from uh, uh, from the big from a big city where mm -hmm. we have mm -hmm. a team, so it takes them like almost a day to get there, and then a day to get yeah. back. So it's it's a big effort. So uh, everything we are we are doing should be very um, self reliant and should be um, um, designed to. Uh, be remotely ma maintained mm -hmm. to uh, to be 
connected when it can basically because if connection is down again there's no one no one to go there and like yeah. check what's what's happening so uh, there is how you deal with it say again how you deal with that how, how what no they try to, to create a very robust systems which yeah. with many layers of uh, robustness mm -hmm. with many layers mm -hmm. of uh, um like could say like failure resilience so uh, there are several points which 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 will try to get back to us and mm -hmm. if, if at least one of them is is, 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 co is connecting back to our servers then we can at least log in and uh, see uh, what's uh, what's happening there and then make a decision uh, what do we do next so um, and like all like the way like we designed this is uh, we um, really diverged from the traditional architecture of how these networks are built mm -hmm. and uh, we um, we uh, took a pretty old technology GSM uh, GSM was the first popular technology in mobile communications mm -hmm. so like all the networks uh, from like late 90s they were GSM yeah, networks GSM, yes yeah. and uh, so this is pretty old technology but it's still very very popular uh, according to some statistics about like 90 percent of all phones in the world support gsm mm -hmm. so it's very widespread mm -hmm. um and um mm, it's if we use um uh, the latest state-of-art technology uh, latest state-of-art uh, chipsets, latest state of art, like software, mm -hmm. then it, is, it becomes possible uh, to, uh, to create a very inexpensive and lightweight mm -hmm. equipment. So a combination of uh, not the very newest technology plus the latest, uh, yeah, plus the latest like achievements in, uh, uh, sorry, in the, the, the old protocol mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, with the latest like technology implemented with the latest state of art technology makes it possible to um, to make it very inexpensive like something which was very complex and uh, expensive in late 90s mm -hmm. nowadays is you know can be done very very easily like there's like a famous uh, comparison that your phone right now is probably more powerful than your computer back in 90s so right right um um, this 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 approach is very interesting, and then we also combine uh, combine this like uh, very efficient radio technology with uh, voice over IP technologies, which is mm -hmm. again the latest, the greatest, uh, uh, latest greatest uh, protocols. Um, which, more, uh, like voice over IP is basically technology which you are using when you are using Skype or okay, okay. when yeah, you are when you are using WhatsApp to call when mm -hmm. you are using basically any um, application to make place a call over the internet. Mm -hmm. It is going. It the, all these technologies have a, have a co collective name: voice over IP. Okay. Voice over the internet. So. Um, we are using like, in the latest um, achievements in this in this field, combining this with the old radio protocol, mm -hmm. which is supported wow. by phones. So, um, and at the end, we got um, like a mobile network which can work with any phone, but at the same time is very very flexible inside and allows us to create a very non traditional architectures which are very efficient um, and uh, allows us to create uh, non-standard applications and mm -hmm. uh, on this mm -hmm. uh, um, on this uh, on this platform like uh, directly routing calls between countries without even like going through many um, many uh, central central locations and things mm -hmm. like this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so um, and now like we are we consider that we have pretty solid solid a solution for um, GSM technology, then now we are starting to move towards 4G technologies, towards data mm -hmm. technologies, mm -hmm. because uh, even though right now um, 4G is not very common in uh, um, 
in rural areas um, in like two three years um, again every Chinese phone will have LTE yeah. built in and so it will make sense for people um, in those villages to have access to internet I mean they are always very interested in internet uh-huh. but um, there are like technological um, issues like you know, power consumption of these phones which are preventing this from happening yeah. but in like two three years we see this happening as well so that's uh, uh, that's our one of our, our next steps and also at the same time uh, we see um, a lot of uh, interest in internet of things developments and because our um, our technology is very flexible again like uh, just as a sound card using sound card you can play you know rock you can play jazz you can play classic music mm-hmm. the same with our uh, the same with our technology, uh, we can uh, use the software-defined radios to uh, to implement uh, like telecommunication protocols like GSM or LTE, or we can uh, use them to 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 create uh, like Internet of Things te- uh, technologies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we're also looking into into doing something there as well. So uh, that's 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 in a nutshell what we what we are doing in Fair Waves. Um, which countries are you working with? So um, we have a number of countries where we are doing pilots, but I think the most interesting right now is uh, is Tanzania. Mm-hmm. Oh. Nice. So you're using basically already existing telecommunication systems and just like sort of spreading it. So it's uh, it it's, it's like a good question because um, our first clients we were building completely uh, self-contained uh, mobile networks, mm-hmm. and well, they're they're still doing this. So, um, like our very the very first installation of our equipment was uh, in Netherlands Hello. to provide uh, uh, communication for uh, for police during uh, public events because. Uh, so events, because event. networks are overloaded. Yes, because uh, during festivals, there are so many people coming to those festivals that public networks goes okay. down. Okay. The yeah. police wanted to communicate, and uh, they wanted to uh, to work undercover. Uh-huh. So mm-hmm. they didn't want to use you know bulk, bulky like walkie talkies because if you're you know taking out a walkie talkie, you're obviously a policeman. So okay. they wanted to use normal normal phones. So they wanted. Uh, like a mobile network, but a mobile network which is not going down uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when there is uh, situations like this. So um, that was our very first, uh, very first installation, and then. So uh, this is like alternative mobile network which we used only yeah. by police. Yeah, it was like ten people okay. for the whole network. Okay. Cool. So, um, like dedicated to only those ten mm-hmm. people, mm-hmm. and then. Um, uh, our other project, which is still ongoing for, uh, quite successfully, is uh, it made a lot of noise in in, in the media. Um, is um, providing communications for uh, indigenous communities in Mexico. Mm-hmm. So there are anywhere from um, somewhere from fifty thousand to a hundred thousand villages in Mexico, which are n- not covered by any um, mobile coverage yeah so um, they may have internet um, they may have satellite communications but they don't have any mobile coverage so and that's a pretty large number yeah so uh, we worked with a non-profit organization which was working with this communities and originally they were providing um, community radios like mm-hmm. FM radios so they were uh, installing FM radios and teaching these communities how to um, maintain ca- how to yeah, maintain FM radio, how to make uh, programs. Yeah. Like they, 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 So they, they did like real broadcasts from communities. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh. That's very popular uh, around the globe. I mean, there are many like pirate radios. Yes. Since 60s or something. Yeah, but it's still quite popular. Mm. I mean, even, even right now in, in in United States, in Canada, yeah, yeah. Uh, there are many pirate radios which are broadcasting this community uh, things. So um, they they came from this community, and mm-hmm. um, the um, uh, guys we are, we are working with they 
they were working in Nigeria, then for like personal reasons they moved to Mexico, so they okay. continued working in Mexico, and at some point they realized that, you know, FM radio is nice, but it's a one-way communication, so they need to provide mm-hmm. a two-way communication for people, and they started looking for technologies which can do this, and they stumbled upon this open-source project which we were participating in, which was a base of, uh, of our equipment, and uh, um, they uh, became our, one of our first, first customers, and uh, we spent some time there helping them install our system, and mm-hmm. uh, we like one of the, the the first village. We connected there. Um, I think it was in two thousand thirteen, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's basically working since then there. Mm-hmm. So since then they connected about uh, fifteen communities. It's a pretty small number compared to fifty thousand, but <laughs> still, uh, still better. And they're yeah. kind of try to accelerate uh, the, the rate they're 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 doing this. And the interesting thing there is that um, um, those those mobile networks were not only um, like self-contained and self-reliant; um, they uh, also were locally owned. So a community mm. actually owns mobile network. A community actually. Um, set mm-hmm. tariff plans. Community pays for this network. Mm-hmm. Community mm-hmm. set tariff plans for this network. Set rules how to use this network. Um, they maintain this network. So, uh, yeah. yes, they. Um, this organization is pretty much just helping with some technical issues, mm-hmm. and also they're helping with uh, connecting this uh, this small networks um, to um, a normal phone system, so people mm-hmm. can actually. Mm-hmm place calls to their uh, like friends in the city and in, in like other cities in the states there's lots of a lot of calls coming from mexico to states because there's lots of uh, people uh, like uh, family members living in the states so and uh, they were able yeah. to drop the cost of uh, so uh, so to call from a village like this to um to a family member in california uh, previously costed uh, this people like a dollar or two dollars per minute uh, and now they can call for like two cents a minute so uh, it's, it's a big it's difference really <laughs> um, yeah, but it's amazing like economically and socially systems that they really own it it's yeah, yeah. that's really amazing yeah and uh, I mean we still have out of installations like this around the world and mm-hmm. you know if someone wants to, to build this they can uh, come to us and they buy they buy our systems yeah. we sometimes don't even know if you're they are installed um so but now it's already like a package prepared. You can just like sell it to someone for install. Yeah, pretty much. There's still some skills required to install mm-hmm. it, but okay. um, it's yeah, it's pretty much you know okay. very easy to, to operate for anyone who has uh, experience with voice over IP networks. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and then we moved to working with uh, existing large carriers, where we just extend their coverage, just because from business perspective it makes uh, much more sense. Mm-hmm. For them, uh, in which way? Uh, from business perspective, for you to, yeah. to work with them. Yeah. Okay. Because it's much larger uh, yeah. market for us. Yeah, sure. So just just in Africa, there is like six hundred million people which are unserved or underserved. Okay. So you help these big uh, telecommunication companies to, to sort of cover these areas. Mm-hmm. Shouldn't they do that themselves? Or I mean. Why don't they do it? Oh, because it's, it's too like expensive. It's too expensive for them. Because it's too expensive. Yeah. Because building a normal, a typical tower um, in a village costs roughly hundred to hundred twenty thousand dollars. And there's not enough profit. Yes, for them and uh, a service. typical, yeah. uh, typical revenue. Like how, a, an average person is paying in this village is uh, like maybe two three dollars per month mm-hmm. maximum. Mm-hmm. It's from one to two, three dollars per month, depending on country and location. So, I mean, you can easily do the math and see like how many people you yeah. need, and that's just not reasonable. Okay, that's so. Right. And since your system helps to drop down costs, yeah, and the, we can do it five to ten times cheaper, so it becomes reasonable uh, to do it. And in many, in, in in many cases, it's in some cases it's uh, um, just enough to return investment in other cases it's profitable so it uh, becomes from a loss making business to mm-hmm. uh, to actually a profit making business 
Are you doing projects in Russia? No. No. Because because of what? Well, multiple reasons. First of all, uh, it's just too difficult. Mm. And uh, again, in which way? Well, Russia is uh, uh, is a large uh, large country with uh, like a very difficult mix of developed and developing um, uh, characteristics. Mm-hmm. So it has it like it has enough technical knowledge. People like, like have enough te- technical knowledge to uh, do a lot of due diligence. At the same mm-hmm. time, it has a lot of um, bureaucracy. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's 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 pretty hard combination to to deal with. Okay. Yeah, makes sense. Plus, our our technology has the most, uh, the, the, the biggest impact of this technology is in uh, places where we can actually power it from solar, mm, which is mm-hmm, again mm-hmm. Uh, not exactly uh, yeah. Russian conditions. That's true. Okay, uh, I'll probably move a little bit to to this like research of mine, which goes a little bit parallel to this. Mm-hmm. Still, we're recording for whoever will listen to this in the future uh, for the archive so uh, as I wrote you what I'm focusing in is this uh, concept of technological disobedience which comes from Cuba and which um, it's just term uh, coined by one Cuban artist and designer and who describes this way uh, pretty much everyday creative practice of Cuban people of um, recycling, repurposing, um, assembling, disassembling, um, somehow remaking, uh, all kinds of things. Mm-hmm. And even there, it was forced by social conditions, by, uh, by technological embargo and crisis, and just uh, the fact that technology was not available for these people, so they were uh, seriously forced to maintain already existing equipment on the, on the island to just keep it going in one or another way. Yet, uh, what I find interesting in it is the very notion of a uh, sort of disres- disrespect to, let's say, authority of technology, of sort of black box and like closed up, up object which with some already defined uh, purposes and, um, let's say, mechanics, algorithms of work mm-hmm. and taking it rather as assemblage of of details that can be remade in one or another way and uh, may be used uh, or reused for different purposes. So, what would you uh, can you anyhow relate to this kind of things? And what would you think about that? And um, you already <laughs> yeah, I want to show you something. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, please show me and. Yeah, if you can comment anything on this, if it makes sense at all, if, do you think it's relevant, do you think it can be productive, and mm-hmm. how? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So, I have a couple stories about this. Uh, so... They are may not be exactly what you are asking for, but this is what I was uh, thinking about um, when I uh, when you explained to me this idea. Mm-hmm. So, um, in uh, chronological order, like on the historical order of the stories. Um, so, first of all, it's um, very interesting how. Um, you know that you know the Russia in nineties was uh, very um, tough on money, yeah. and uh, people um, were not very rich. And uh, at the same time, there were a lot of engineers, a lot of technically mm-hmm. skilled people 
uh, who um, wanted, who were very, very interested, I mean, in um, in technology, and uh, what happened back then is that uh, people were not able to pay. Uh, they were able to buy a computer, but they uh, were not able uh, to pay for software. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So remember uh, how expensive a software is, right? So. Um, until pretty recently, people were not able to uh, pay for operating systems. They weren't able to pay even for basic programs like, you know, um, word processing. And so, uh, basically, uh, because at the same time, there were a lot of people who were skilled. Those programs were pirated, mm -hmm. they were cracked, and uh, there was huge... Um, um, I can't say market because it wasn't a market, but uh, like you basically could get any program you want for free. Well, right? you, st you still can. It's still going yeah, you on, still right? can. But I mean, the the phenomena is a little bit um, kind of it's not completely gone, but uh, in many in many cases, it's. Uh, uh, much more bleak mm -hmm. right now than it used to be, because um, that's what I was that, that's that's what I was, I was saying is that the fact that uh, people weren't able to uh, pay mm -hmm. for this technology but they really needed it, um, uh, they uh, they really like went around. They uh, there was a, a whole culture of uh, like pirating programs, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't uh, perceived as anything bad in in the yeah. in, 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 in the society, and it was uh, kind of silently approved by the government, which mm -hmm. did not enforce any yeah. any um, IPR uh, enforcement until yeah. again like mid uh, mid thousands, basically. There were absolutely no punishment mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. any um, intellectual property violations in software for. For more than a decade in Russia, so I think there was even no such concept. Yeah, like, I mean, yeah. there was a concept, but again, there was no there was no laws. Mm -hmm. Even if there was something, it wasn't enforced, and it was just a norm. And um, this, it's it's very uh, it's very surprising that uh, like sometimes, and it it was uh, it's good and bad at the same time uh, because. The, the psychology of, uh, like, again, as, you, as you rightly mentioned, there's still this, this psychology it didn't go away. Mm -hmm. um, it's like people are now mostly buying Windows. They're still, they're mostly buying like, you know, like Microsoft Word, but there's many other programs which are pirated. There are many games or a lot of things which are still pirated. Uh, and this is a very interesting from a, a cultural and psychological perspective because um, when uh, you talk to, um, well, first of all, uh, like uh, when the Russian engineers meet uh, Western engineers, mm -hmm. uh, Western engineers uh, sometimes um, very surprised to know that, like uh, Russian engineers know the top most expensive programs very well, <laughs> and they are surprised like how they can pay for them. Yeah, right. Because like oh, like we never were able to pay for this program, and you know, we use this like cheaper program. But yeah, Russians and Russian engineers always use the top, the best programs ever because they don't pay for them. Um, so, and the other thing um, that was on the good side. So this allowed a lot of technological uh, mm -hmm. progress to happen because yeah. uh, Russian people were not limited uh, to what they can afford. They they could afford. Uh, to get the top, the best programs and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. create uh, like what they wanted with the best tools they had. So um, uh, at the same time, this uh, kind of inhibited um, inhibited the open source movement in the country mm -hmm. because in many Western countries, open source movement um, right. wasn't a, was only partially ideological. Mm -hmm. And in large part, it was purely economical. So you, know, you don't pay for open source mm -hmm. software normally. So when people were developing open source software because they didn't want to pay to, to companies. Right, right. But because uh, Russians didn't pay, uh, they, so they, they never had... Uh, yeah. Yeah, in, in Russia, open source was always ideological. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It only recently, again, when those um, 
uh, intellectual property rights started being enforced, then it kind of became economically um, mm -hmm. supported. Mm -hmm. But historically, again, for two decades, it was pretty much only ideological uh, reason if people use it in open source. Yeah. So, um, at the same time, we see a very similar similar uh, phenomena in China right now. There is a, um, a culture. I forgot the word for this, but uh, it was recently popularized by some uh, by some uh, researchers in in, uh, in the U.S. Um, basically, there is the same. What what happened to to software in Russia happens uh, now to hardware in China. So mm -hmm. there is the whole. Um, kind of informal It's like basically reverse engineer stuff and it's, create a new kind it's, of gadgets. It's not, I mean, oh, yeah. it's not so much about reverse engineering, it's just uh, the, the culture that um, I can take whatever I want in hardware, mm -hmm. I can modify however I mm -hmm. want, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah. um, I can produce it, and there's nothing bad in this. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a, like a free a rotation of design so there are forums where people yeah. sharing their designs and other people are taking these designs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. modifying these designs and um uh, like uh, yeah, yes people like sometimes just like take some commercial stuff they disassemble mm -hmm. it they um like recreate the same thing um uh, but it's it's not only about just copying it actually became a whole ecosystem of people yeah. who are exchanging designs because um, it's normal for them that uh, it's free. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's mm -hmm. it's like kind of public domain. Yeah. So they, they they just think that it that all hardware is public domain. You know, I can take it, I can modify it, I can use it. So. And this uh, creates a, a much faster cycle of innovation in hardware in China mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, because there is no enforcement of IP protection. Right, right. So um, this is this is one story about uh, yeah. Um, yeah, really which, which I um, which I uh, which I was uh, uh, remembered. Um, the other story is. Uh, mm, in um, when I was uh, when I was a student in early two thousand, there was uh, there were many uh, Siemens phones. Uh, you know, you may remember mm -hmm. like small uh, mm -hmm. dumb phones yeah. manufactured by Siemens, very uh, robust, hard to break. Yeah, you know, like I remember it pretty well. Stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's very good phones, um, and uh, uh, what happened is that. The phones were so popular um, that uh, people, like hacker community, started looking into this, into them, and um, they uh, found um, they basically found um, a way to modify firmware. Mm -hmm. So uh, they dumped firmware of many phones. Uh, they uh, started creating. Um, binary patches which modify the behavior of those phones. Uh, so they didn't have access to any source code. They literally uh, worked um, uh, like like Livsha. They they worked uh -huh. on, on binary code. They yeah. they created oh uh, binary patches which which modified this. So and they created. There was a whole like huge forum wow. of people doing this, and there was a repository of those binary patches. There was a a software written which automated applying these binary pages. Uh -huh. It was like the whole ecosystem uh, grew up around those phones. Um, and uh, I mean, there, is, there was like, there was a repository on the internet where you can browse those pages okay, and well, like download them. Well, can you and, share with me later? Yeah, I can try yeah. to find it. It's been a long time ago, it's like 10 years ago. Okay. But, yeah. um, but what kind of things they were making out of these phones? What? Yeah, I'm just I'm trying to remember. It was like basic things like, oh, I, I want to know uh, like exact percentage of the batteries mm 
Mm-hmm. So like it's not only that I don't want to see the bar which yeah. shows me like four positions. Yeah. I want to know how many percents of my battery. Is. <laughs> so they replaced it. Uh, they replaced it, this like graphical thing mm-hmm. by um, by actual um, by actual percentage. Um, uh, like n- each phone is is looking um, f- at every moment of time. Each phone is actually listening to not only to one uh, tower. It's listening to six towers. Um, and it's jumping between the, those six towers. So uh, normally you see this, you know, famous um, like bars, mm-hmm. like five bars, yeah, yeah. right? So it, it only shows you very, very rough estimate uh, of uh, of the of one tower each fo- your phone is looking at. Okay. Yeah. So there was a patch which, first of all, gave you exact number of decibels of the mm-hmm, received mm-hmm. signal, not mm-hmm. the bar, but decibels. Okay. And secondly, it showed you five bars, but each bar was, the height of this bar was showing signal of each of the six cells the phone is looking at. Okay. So you actually knew uh, not only the, the quality of the of one tower your, your, to- your phone is talking to, but all, the, all six towers. And... Um, there were um, like patches which um, um, uh, there were patches which reprogrammed buttons so mm-hmm. to make them more uh, more useful. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I remember that you could uh, like really re- like uh, uh, like put some actions on uh, on different buttons. So like you long press some button and something mm-hmm. happens. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, which wasn't like originally uh, in this. Um, like someone created even uh, a, a, a talking clock uh, so there. So it's it like, was saying the time. Yeah, it was saying that so you could press a button. It actually said in okay. human voice the the, <laughs> the, the 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 current time. So and it was all done as, as a binary patching, which written directly into assembly right. of, of of this uh, of this phone. So. That was like a big, big movement um, before Siemens died. That, that this is one of those phones. By the way. <laughs> did you did, did you made your own that time? Yeah, I, I, I did. Well, I didn't. I didn't do. I didn't write patches. But mm-hmm. yeah, I had a phone and I I applied all the patches on my phones. All like all three phones. I had in university uh, were <laughs> Siemens and uh, all of them yeah. were, were patched. So it was a lot of fun. Um, so now, like to more, uh, to more, like recent times, um, an interesting story which happened in the software-defined radio domain, mm-hmm. uh, w- which led to like a huge, like huge. A burst of uh, popularity mm-hmm. um, because originally software defined radio was kind of a very very um, specialized domain. So, um, like even even like among geeks, very few people okay. like, work it with radios. Um, but at some point, someone working with the uh, DVB dongles. What's that? It's a DVB is a standard for digital TV. Okay. So um, there were dongles like this, uh, which you plug into your into your laptop. You plug antenna, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Uh, now you can watch TV and uh, listen yeah, to radio with your laptop. So um, people uh, who wrote drivers for uh, for Linux for this uh, for these DVB dongles, they realized that. Um, there is a mode in uh, in which so there is two modes on this uh, in this uh, in this dongles in one mode they actually decode video um, on the chip and only send you video to your mm-hmm. computer mm-hmm. and there's another mode which was uh, originally designed uh, to work for FM radio mm-hmm. uh, in which um, you actually got a digitized radio stream directly. Radio is like mm-hmm. so they they realized that these DVB dongles are uh, very inexpensive software defined radios. 
uh, it's receive only it can't transmit anything but you got a receiver so previously just for for some background um, in 2000 uh, like seven eight uh, an inexpensive software-defined radio was considered about thousand dollars Oh wow so that was considered an inexpensive so uh, defined all software defined radios which were expensive could cost you like ten thousand dollars or more and uh, original technology was coming from uh, from military so you can mm -hmm, imagine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so um, there was like another re re revolution when affordable uh, software defined radios came and again affordable back then was like a thousand dollars so um and then when people uh, discovered this they realized that this thing uh, you could buy it on ebay for like ten dollars mm -hmm. or twelve dollars um, so uh and that was like a huge 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 difference so even though the performance was crappy even though like it was very small bandwidth it's only receive mm -hmm. it's still uh like comparing what you are getting for the price yeah. what was a big yeah. thing so uh they um they wrote software which um which was um um which was uh um turning these DB dongles into software defined radios and again like uh, a huge movement was created and it's still very active um to so th this is not the original DB dongle uh, you can see that uh, there is a company mm -hmm. company name it says e4000 sdr and dbt um so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's 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 already uh, a clone of this DVB dongle okay. specifically for SDR use. I see. So this is uh, also the same, uh, the, the, the same, the same SDR, but it has um, a much better enclosure. But that's not not the only difference. It also has a very special, high quality clock, okay. uh, so it can it's produce a much better signal when you uh, like, mm -hmm. when, uh, yeah when you receive it's. The signal is much more clean and precise than okay. yeah, when you use something like this. So people like created the, like several companies who said manufacturing the uh, manufacturing clones of those uh, of those dongles. There was a lot of software written, and now uh, like there is like a website mm -hmm. uh, specifically dedicated to these low cost radios, and there is like uh, there is like uh, R and D labs and universities mm -hmm. who are mm -hmm. using mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, this uh, this discovery literally created uh, the new wave of uh, of uh, of interest in radio systems right, because right. people who never ever did anything with radio just like normal programmers who were like uh, writing you know, creating some websites or mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. writing some shitty code they suddenly uh, could afford to play with radios mm -hmm, and this mm -hmm. created to um, like all kinds of um, all kinds of research all, all kinds of like applications uh, like people created a website to monitor um, to monitor uh, 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 locations of uh, of um, it's called of, of airplanes mm -hmm. in real time. It's mm -hmm. called Flight right. Radar Twenty Four. Yeah. Yeah. It's basically a community uh, community website where people who have these dongles they oh, um, th oh. they take these dongles, they connect some antenna. You put this antenna on your roof. You connect this to your laptop, laptop or some other computer. Uh -huh. You install some software, and the software scans. Uh, scans frequencies uh, receive uh, signals which are transmitted by airplanes and send them to this website and then this website aggregates oh, wow. all this information and shows a real time a live map uh, about okay. about locations i didn't know that those websites were made like independently by okay wow. and there is a similar software for monitoring uh, vessels mm. marine uh, marine vessels yeah so um like you now, people are now receiving uh, 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 
weather imagery directly from satellites mm -hmm. and uh, like all kind of crazy stuff is happening so um, it's like it literally created a huge movement just because of one completely unrelated like not not unrelated but a feature which was never made for this made for this yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and there was like a lot of problems because this this chip which was originally used in this DVB that went out of uh, manufacturing, and right. at some point of time there was like really uh, because the company was uh, basically I, I don't remember it was either sold or, or it died, mm -hmm. and the, there was only like so many of those chips on the market, and people were trying to buy these chips and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, get get them before they're gone. But I think now they found some other chips which are which have similar uh, similar parameters. So uh, th th this problem was solved. Um, so. Um, we also like uh, saw a similar uh, thing happening to um, um, how to say um, so for example Another group of people who are uh, researching, who were researching uh, phones, uh, but not the uh, Siemens ones, they were uh, looking at uh, Motorola phones. Mm -hmm. They found that uh, they can uh, get access to uh, what's called um, a baseband processor, which is a processor. So a traditional, traditional phone has uh, two processing units. Mm -hmm. One unit is which shows you nice graphics, play games, run apps, right. and another processor, which is separate, uh, which uh, does all the radio like, processing. So mm -hmm. it actually talks to the mobile network. It actually like does all this stuff, and it communicates uh, with your application processor uh, via some I API. So you normally only when you like install Android on your phone or something mm -hmm. like this, mm -hmm. you only interface with uh, with your application processor, right. yeah. and uh, the, the 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 other processor, which is actually which is actually uh -huh. phone, yeah, it's a main thing, yeah, <laughs> which which actually <laughs> make calls. Uh, it's it's seen as a, like external black box normally. Okay. So yeah. these people realize that they can actually. Uh, they also found a way to change uh, firmware, the binary, uh, for this uh, for this baseband processor, right. for the modern processor, and they also created the binary patches which allowed to base to to route uh, raw data from this uh, from this um, uh, from this phone uh, to to a computer, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. they wrote uh, a full, not completely full, but decently full stack of uh, of software uh, to uh, turn this this dumb phone um, sorry basically this one, to, to to replace uh, the software which was running on this closed proprietary chip mm -hmm. with the open source software which runs on your laptop and this unlocked many uh, many features uh, on the phone uh, interesting for hackers like for example you can turn a phone into a base station so you can oh. you can uh, turn mm -hmm. a phone into this thing which is on the tower, which actually transmits radio waves mm -hmm. to a mm -hmm. phone. Mm -hmm. So it kind of switch it rolls, okay. which was never a like, phone was never designed for this, but it right. became possible because oh, wow. people could, could have access to this and uh, like many other things. Um, so uh, these are like more recent stories of kind of refurbishing um, technologies, I would say. Um, they have nothing to do with like, ecology, but it's interesting stories, I think. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's really great. That's actually, thank you a lot for that. Um, I think I would skip, I mean, we already started to talk about this ecological question of mine, and I, I would skip it for now. And yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess we're more or less done with my questions. If there's anything you 
I want to add to all this, uh, like for archive or, I don't know, any, any, any concerns you want to share? It's, again, question out of blue, but just in case. Mm. I don't know, I just uh, maybe want to say that um, that uh, it's, the hacker culture in Russia is very different from uh, like hacker culture in, in mm -hmm. Europe, for example. And uh, I think it's partially due to the fact that um, hacker culture in Europe is uh, much more mature. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like uh, Chaos Communication Club, which is one of the oldest like, organizations yeah. uh, around uh, hacker culture, was created in, 18, in uh, 1984. So <laughs> it's really old. Um, it's and, older than me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's like, I mean, there's nothing like this in Russia. So uh, Russian culture is. It kind of it did have a culture which was similar to to hacker culture during Soviet times. Uh -huh. There's lots of engineers who yeah, again, like hacked and everything. Yeah. Mm. It was a whole DIY moment, yes, but it was completely wiped out during nineties. Yeah, unfortunately, very unfortunately. It, it, it just the the whole uh, what's it like lineage was lost. So uh, what was what was creating right now is uh, is creating. On the like f from from the start, it's mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's not based on um, like any like existing culture. I mean, definitely it's still like influenced by this whole like Soviet culture, but um, it's it's influenced by this culture in general sense, like because we all just belong to this culture, mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. like culturally, in general yeah. culturally. But it's not that there is. Uh, lineage coming from there in terms yeah, of like engineering right. so um, a lot of uh, a lot of things uh, like we are importing um, so this idea of hacker space came came from um, came from uh, from green to us right but um, there's a lot of adaptation and localization happening because like we found that it's pretty much impossible to run a hacker space and uh, like it is run in in Europe, um, to run the same way in, in Moscow, mm -hmm. for example, for many reasons, but like economical and just uh, the way people uh, behave and uh, okay. the, the culture is, is very so different. Tell people are how not, it works here. Yeah. Um, people, well, first of all, like economically, it's very different because. Um, in, in Europe, uh, rent is inexpensive and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, in salaries are salaries are are, are high. Mm -hmm. In Moscow, uh, rent is expensive and salaries are low, so um, <laughs> it's much less. Uh, uh, it's much harder uh, to, to find a good spot in Moscow which you can afford. And in in uh, in Europe and in the States, a lot of hawker space have leave on, on donations. Mm -hmm. It's completely impossible right. in Russia. We yeah, tried this. Mm -hmm doesn't work 100%, mm -hmm. which is just, uh, it's partially because again, there's a big mismatch between uh, uh, salaries and um, and rent, but also because there's no culture of nation in Russia. Right. Yeah. It's just not there. And it's not only uh, for hacker spaces, there's a lot of problems for many like non-profits who are trying to fundraise for, like, for a cause, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. they can't because there's no culture of donations. Um, and uh, mm, and then uh, there is uh, all the problems with big city because um, Moscow, like just commute time in Moscow, makes it very hard for people to um, have a meaningful mm -hmm. uh, meaningful time in the week at uh, the weekends, but uh, at the evenings, for example. So there's no people or very few people who are ready to regularly come to some location in the evening yeah. to do something yeah. um, just because they're spending like more than an hour to get back uh, from, from their uh, work to, to their home and you know they still have family etc etc so um, it's not like a, in European cities which are usually smaller and mm. like 
it's not that far, and so people can actually spend an evening yeah. at some place. In Moscow, it's very different. So, out of this uh, um, influence, like what um, business models can be used for for hacker spaces, and uh, also uh, um, another thing which which we are facing is that again, it was cultural, is that um, in Russia. Um, even though there was this like th thriving ecosystem of pirated software, uh, there was uh, um, no. Let's say there's very little um, ecosystem in, for example, like knowledge sharing. I mean, mm -hmm. there is there are forums, mm -hmm. right? There is like a yeah. large ecosystem of various forums, but uh, like online forums. I mean. But uh, people are not used to um, share this knowledge offline, mm -hmm. so there's much mm -hmm. less mm -hmm. of this happening. And also, people um, um, are not used to working on uh, um, like. Um, community projects, even though it may sound very contradictory to the notion that Soviet Union was all about community work, um, people are, are not used to uh, create projects which are, I mean, like in projects, I mean, uh, like hardware projects, for example, mm -hmm. or software projects, which are uh, maintained by a new group of people. And yeah. what happens yeah. is that um, a typical like syndrome of Russian inventor is that he cre he creates something, um, he shows it at some forum to his friends. Mm -hmm. You know, he brags Online about only, this, yeah. and then um, he, he he's doing nothing to move this forward. He is doing nothing to create mm -hmm. a, any community around this. Um, if it's a commercial thing, he does he does nothing to market this mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. to commercialize this, and it's basically. Um, just goes away unnoticed by a larger world. Okay, yeah, right? I see. So, uh, there's, there's just, um, like, people are living in their own bubble. It's a very small bubble. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, uh, partially that's because of... Uh, uh, this bubble has a shape of Russia. <laughs> so people are very afraid to look outside of Russia, oh, yeah. uh, partially yeah. because of the language barrier and uh, partially just because it's us versus them. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a big problem. So, um, kind of yeah, new, like a younger generation is partially better at this. Yeah, I think it's slowly like, changing, but, but only partially. Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, even even like was with my initial research on Russian hyperspaces. I mean, there are quite quite some already in different parts. Of yeah, the I'm country. happy this this happened. So like we were the very first one. Yeah. And uh, like people were coming to us, and uh, because we did uh, some outreach in the media, mm -hmm. there were like some publications. Yeah. First media, uh, people uh, were like writing to us. Oh, like I want to write, or I want to open. Uh, in hacker space in uh, Nizhny Novgorod, oh, I want to open a hacker space in Novosibirsk mm -hmm. or in mm -hmm. Kiev or in somewhere, and we like always try to encourage them. And this, I think, this kind of gave gave its results, and uh, um, I'm really happy that this this happened. Yeah, but I also know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> It's like yeah, in different spheres are the same. I mean, in arts, it's pretty much the same. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. Thank you very much for this incredibly interesting talk. And yeah, we're done. Thank you. Thank you.